How's it going guys? We're back at it again with another video. So we're gonna do a rainwater harvesting Q&A. I get a lot of questions on my videos about our rainwater harvesting system. So I just wanted to do a brief overview of our entire system and answer some of the most common questions that I see. Now, if you're new to my channel and you wanna stay up to date with all of our rainwater harvesting projects, we've got solar projects going on and I'm building a 4,000 square foot garage right now. We live on a 40 acre lot completely off grid in southeastern Arizona. Definitely subscribe to this channel so that you can stay up to date and get educated and inspired on how to live the off-grid dream. Now let's go over a brief overview of our rainwater harvesting system. Now my wife and I, we live in a 24 foot long tiny house that I built myself that you can actually check out the, the entire build on this channel. Since we live in that tiny house, the roof catchment surface is only about 200 square feet. And then we have an awning on one side of it, and that's only about 300 square feet. And because the collection surface of the tiny house and the awning is only about 500 square feet, I had to come up with a way to capture more clean rainwater. So what I ended up doing was building a roof on the ground. So I just call this a rain roof. And I got the original idea from Joe from Homesteadonomics. Um, his original kind of rain roof idea was actually a rain tarp that he built on the ground. And I just thought, well, if I build a roof that's just a little bit above the ground, and we're gonna be able to collect thousands and thousands of clean rainwater off this collection surface. So the roof is 72 feet long, and then it's about 40 feet going up the slope here. And how this system works is that since the elevation difference from where the rain roof and the gutter is, is much higher than where our collection tanks is, we can actually build this roof on the ground and have it gravity feed into our tanks. Now, if you wanna see an entire playlist of how I built this rain roof and a lot of the thoughts behind it, then there'll be a, uh, a playlist up in the cards right there. So definitely check that out. Now, from the gutter on the rain roof, there are two four inch white PVC drain pipes that are trenched underground and run up into our main collection tank here. In order for this system to work properly, what I had to do was partially bury these tanks about four feet below grade. From this point here up to our rain roof, it's about 150 feet long, we're on about a two or 3% gradient. And based on that dimension, we have about a five, maybe five and a half foot um, elevation change. These tanks are eight feet tall and with them partially buried four feet down, it gives us enough of that elevation difference for this system to work properly. So each of these collection tanks are 2,500 gallons. So we have a total of 10,000 gallons of total capacity right here. So just a few feet away from our main collection tanks, I have a backup tank here, which is completely filled and it is a 1,500 gallon tank. So from our shed roof, which is about 120 square feet or so, we have the water coming from there going directly into a culvert cistern. So this is four feet in diameter by about six feet tall. I think it holds around 500 to 600 gallons of water. We also collect water from our tiny house roof and our awning. So it's about, like I said, about 500 square feet of catchment surface. And it goes into another culvert cistern, which is about uh, 1500 or 1600 gallons. So that means we have a total water capacity of around 13,500 gallons. Now, a common question that I see people are asking, why don't you just drill a well? Now we'll go into the cost of our system a little bit later in this video, but we got some quotes for a well and it was gonna cost anywhere between 10 to $15,000. It's my opinion that rainwater is far superior to well water in terms of its quality, um, but cost was something that we certainly thought about and I'll go into the cost of our system also a little bit later on. And on top of that, from the self-reliance perspective, and being good stewards of the land, I do believe that doing rainwater harvesting is definitely better. Now, another question that I see quite a bit is rainwater harvesting illegal in your area? And rainwater harvesting is not only legal in Arizona, but it's certainly encouraged along with gray water harvesting as well. Um, obviously Arizona, this is a desert climate. Water is certainly one of the biggest issues in terms of growth. Most of the water that goes to Phoenix and Tucson actually comes from the Colorado River through an open air canal. And it's one of the biggest energy consumers in the state of Arizona is pumping and moving that water from the Colorado River, which borders California and Arizona and is pumped all the way out here. Now there are certain states and provinces around the world where rainwater harvesting is actually illegal. And to me, that just doesn't really, it doesn't really make any sense since it's something that is, that can be really good for the land. Now, if you do live in a place where rainwater harvesting is illegal, my advice to you is either do it illegally and just kind of, you know, fly under the radar. The other option 
is to just move to a place where rainwater harvesting is legal. And that could be as easy as a Google search, just type in, is rainwater harvesting legal in Utah or in California or in another state that you're living in? Now, another common question that I get regarding our system is how much did it cost? Now, the biggest cost for us is our tanks. And the reason for that is because our, we really only have two rainy seasons. So we just went through our monsoon season in July and August, and then we also get some rains during the winter time. Throughout most of the year, we really don't get very much rain. So when it does rain, we have to capture as much as we can and hold on to it. So all of our rainwater tanks cost about $9,000 and it cost me about $2,000 in materials to build the rain roof. Now that price might scare you away, um, but I also did buy Polymart tanks, which are made in the US of A. Now there are a lot cheaper tank options um, if you're not too fussy with color or exactly how they look. Now I wanted to go with some tanks that had a really good warranty. So I think the Polymarts are a 25 year warranty but they've had these in use, I think, for around 40 years as well. So you might be wondering how many gallons or how many liters of water your current roof will capture. So the easiest way to figure this out is for a steel roof is that for every 1,000 square feet of roof catchment surface and every inch of rain that you get, you'll capture around 600 gallons of water. So if you had a 2,000 square foot roof and you had 10 inches of rain, then that roof would capture around 12,000 gallons of water on that 10 inches of rain. It is also not recommended to use the water that you may capture from a roof that has asphalt shingles on it um, to use for personal consumption. So if you're gonna be using it inside your house, you know you're gonna be showering with it, you're gonna be using it to cook or to drink or anything like that, um, it's not recommended and that's mainly just because of all the chemicals and stuff that are used in the asphalt shingles. It'll kind of leach into your water. So metal roofs are definitely one of the best sources of clean potable water that you can use. So another common question that I get is regarding the garage that I'm building right now. The garage footprint is 85 by 55. So it's over 4,600 square feet. So over the course of a year, this is gonna capture a lot of rainwater. And we're definitely gonna be putting some big tanks um, to harvest and to store that rainwater. Another thing is, is that you don't necessarily just have to collect rainwater off of a roof surface. Um, there's lots of things that you can do also with earthworks, with basins, with berms, with swales, with all that kind of stuff. And a great book on that is by Brad Lancaster called Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond. He's got two volumes of that book. Um, I recommend checking both of those out because they are a great resource if you want to get started with rainwater harvesting and getting ideas for how to do a lot of this type of stuff. So another common question that we get is how do we treat our rainwater and is it safe to drink? So all the water that we capture, it comes from those 2,500 gallon tanks that I've been showing you outside through some underground pipes. It gets pressurized by the shallow well pump, um, goes through the pressure tank, and then it comes up through this first filter right here and through another one as well. So the first one is a standard poly cartridge and the next one here is a carbon filter. So I'll link to these filters in the description box and in the comment section below. Um, but they're just some standard DuPont whole house cartridges. So we have the poly cartridges here, which reduces any kind of debris or any kind of sediment that might be in the water. And then the carbon filter, I don't know exactly what it does, but it sounded pretty good. So any of the water that we use in the shower, that we use in the sink for our dishes, or even for irrigating our garden, um, it only goes through those two filters that I just showed you. For any water that we cook with or that we drink, we put through our Berkey filters. So the Berkey filter basically it's one of those things where it eliminates like 99.9% .9 of you know, bacteria, any type of heavy metals or anything like that. And it really cleans the water in a very effective and inexpensive way. So you just put your water in the top chamber here. It just gravity feeds through some black filters here. And then it comes out into the bottom chamber here, nice and clean. Now to keep the water in our tanks nice and safe, and so that there isn't any algae growth in it. Now, one main thing that promotes algae growth is when the water is in sunlight. So these tanks are impervious to light. And what's nice about that is that there's not really gonna be any algae growth in the tanks. And what I do just to keep the water a little bit cleaner, and especially since there's not gonna be any substantial bacteria growth or algae growth or anything like that, is I add a very small amount of bleach to our water. Now you might think, oh my God, you're adding bleach to your water. Now, if you're drinking city water, the amount of crap, the amount of chemicals and stuff that is in your water coming from the city is far more than anything I'm gonna be able to add to these tanks. But after we get our monsoon rains, I just add a little bit of bleach to each one of those tanks there. 
and I don't have to do that for the rest of the year. So another common question that we get is why don't you have a first flush? So I modeled this system off of Joe's system. He's been living on rainwater, uh, primarily on rainwater, about 90-95% for the last eight or nine years. He doesn't have a first flush system. He didn't want to, um, he didn't want the added expense or anything like that or the extra complication that that would create. Um, so basically the way that his system is set up is the same way that ours is set up too. So all the quote unquote dirty water that's coming directly from the roof. So any sand or sediment or any gnarlies is gonna go into this tank first. Now what happens here is once this tank completely fills up, it overflows into the other three tanks. So the other three tanks are connected underground with some one inch PVC. So they fill up evenly as this one gets filled up from this tank here. And here's some footage from a storm that we just had showing you how that water is transferring over. This tank is already completely full. So the water is going across that, uh, across that four inch pipe there. So in our future system on the garage, I'm getting some ideas for another way of doing a first flush as opposed to having a dedicated tank to do that. Just having some smaller tanks to do that instead of installing weird things that are going to go on the uh, out by the gutters there. Now another question that I see quite a bit is isn't rainwater really acidic and you shouldn't be drinking or consuming it? Now I've never had my water tested which might be something that would be fun to do but I'll give you that one. Maybe this water is a little bit more acidic than maybe well water or city water. But I judge by results and not necessarily by theory. I know so many people living entirely on rainwater and all their water that they drink and consume comes from the rain and they don't seem to have any ill health or anything like that. But if I'm totally in the wrong on this one, let me know in the comments below. But I don't think it's something that you really have to worry about. Now another really important topic to talk about with regards to rainwater is conservation and how much that you're gonna be using. Now we do have a few water saving strategies, uh, but for the most part, we don't really monitor it and we don't really try to control how much water that we use. So we have a 12 gallon water heater that my wife absolutely hates because she can only have a short shower. Um, but what's nice about that is that we can't sit under the shower for like 20 or 30 minutes and just be like, oh, yeah, so I can just have a shower and just waste so much water. Something else that we have that a lot of people don't have is that we have a composting toilet. So a composting toilet doesn't require any water. What's great about that is when you actually look at the stats of how much a toilet actually uses, it's about 30% of your domestic water use. So just by using a composting toilet instead of a flush toilet, um, you're saving about 30% of your total water bill. And I know a lot of people don't really wanna go the composting toilet route, um, but if you're looking to kind of minimize the size of your rainwater harvesting system, using a composting toilet is definitely one of the best ways to do it. So another way that we conserve and minimize our water usage is that we utilize all of our gray water back into the landscape. So all the water that comes from our washing machine, that comes from our shower, that comes from our sink, all that water, it doesn't go to a septic system, it goes through underground drain pipes and goes and waters fruit trees that we have out in our yard. So what's great about that is that the vast majority of water that we collect through our collection surfaces, most of it, probably like at least 70, 80% of it, goes back into the landscape, which is fantastic. So the last question that I get quite a bit is like, how do I get started with this kind of stuff? Obviously there's so many resources on YouTube and so many videos to watch, so that's always a great place to start. Um, I definitely start looking at your climate data for your area or the area that you wanna live in and start seeing how much rainwater that you're collecting throughout the year. And also what's really important is to look at the times of the year when you're not collecting or there isn't as much rain. And those are the times that you really have to plan for because you wanna make sure that you have enough water capacity to be able to make it through those times where you're not getting as much rain. So a great book to figure out how much you actually use and to give you some estimates is this book here. It is called Create an Oasis with Gray Water. I'll have a link to it down below to Amazon. And the other two books that I mentioned are these ones here, Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond. Um, so these are great books by Brad Lancaster. He's actually a local in Tucson. He's got quite an amazing third of an acre place in Tucson. Um, Kirsten Dirksen 
also did a uh, basically did a tour of his entire property. Um, so I'll actually, I'll link that down below in the description box and in the comments section. There's going to be a lot of links down there, including all the timestamps for all these questions. But for us, rainwater harvesting has not really changed how we live our lives or anything like that. Um, it's something that I really like doing because the water, it just falls free from the sky. It's very consistent, very predictable. And like I mentioned before, Joe from Homesteadonomics, um, he's been living primarily on rainwater for almost a decade now, and he got advice and tips from people that have been doing this for 30, 40 years. So it can certainly be done in this climate. He only lives about an hour away from me, so I consider him to be um, a YouTube neighbor, so to speak. And I got a lot of my ideas from him, so I'm very grateful for the information that he put out, and I'm glad that I'm able to share with you guys to inspire and educate you so that you can start doing some rainwater harvesting. So I'll have a video later this week showing the trusses going up on the garage. That's gonna be happening tomorrow. Awesome, thanks so much for watching guys. I'll catch you on the next video. Talk to you soon. Peace.